Hello and welcome to our primary lesson today. We're going to get started with an activity song from Brother Balitz. All right. No frowns. We don't want any frowns. In fact, let's sing about smiling. If at first you meet a chance to meet a frown, do not let it stay. Quickly turn it upside down and smile that frown away. No one likes a frowning face, change it for a smile. Make the world a better place by smiling all the while. We are now excited to have a special message from Bishop Stamper. My friends in the primary and Monroe Ward, I'm so happy and pleased to be able to be with you today. Thank you, Sister Bailitz, for giving me some time to speak with all of you. And it's my privilege as your bishop to spend a couple of minutes with you today to talk about Come Follow Me this week. Specifically, one of the most important things about the gospel that really always touches my heart and that's the theme of the gathering of Israel on both sides of the veil. But more specifically, I want to talk about missionary work in this life. And I want to paint a picture, okay? So let's start, and I'm going to share with you a couple of slides as well. So um, remember in, on April 6, 1830, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was organized, okay? And after that sacred gathering of nearly four dozen saints at the Whitmer home in Fayette, New York, uh, on that special day, the church was officially restored in this dispensation. That means that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was 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 live. It was it was it was open for business, right? And this little group of Latter-day Saints that were there, these 48 saints were then given the responsibility to take the restored gospel to everybody in the world. Now think about that for a second. 48 people, that's it. We're taking the response, we're given the responsibility to take the gospel to everyone else in the world. Billions and billions of Heavenly Father's children, okay? But the Lord knew who he was calling and, and what his converts to the gospel would do with that sacred calling. And so one of those eager um, missionaries in this dispensation was me, right? Now, I wasn't part of the early church, but I was able to serve a mission full time in Haiti for 25 months. And it was just a wonderful experience and I absolutely loved it. But in the early days of the church, the very first missionary that was called was a young man by the name of Samuel Harrison Smith. Yep, that's right. It was the prophet Joseph Smith's younger brother. And did you know that, just a fun little fact, that Samuel Smith, his family actually called him Harrison. Not just Samuel Smith, but they called him Harrison Smith, okay? So he was the first official missionary of the church. And so what his mission was, was pretty simple. The Book of Mormon had just been printed, and they printed uh, a couple thousand copies of the Book of Mormon, but they, they carried a big printer's debt. And so they had to be able to pay for the cost of the Book of Mormon. And, and Martin Harris, one of the early founders of the church, one of the, one of the early saints in the church history, uh, and one of, the, one of the folks that were instrumental in getting the Book of Mormon printed, um, actually mortgaged his farm so that they could pay the printer to actually print all these copies of the Book of Mormon. So Samuel Smith's first mission was to carry with him as many copies of the newly published Book of Mormon as he could and sell them to anybody who was interested to help raise the funds to help pay for the printing costs. Now, that was a pretty big de debt, and it was an 18-month mortgage that was on Martin Harris's farm, and it was it was for $3,000. So he had basically 18 months to pay for this. So they felt some pressure to go ahead and, and get the Book of Mormon out to as many people as possible. Now in those days, a, a brand new copy of the Book of Mormon uh, actually cost about $1.25. That's it, right? 
only a dollar twenty-five. But in our money today, that would be the equivalent of about thirty-four dollars. So imagine your job was to sell copies of of the Book of Mormon uh, to to people um, that really weren't that receptive to the Book of Mormon at that time. Okay, so as Samuel started off. He, he was a little bit frustrated because there wasn't a warm reception. There wasn't a lot of people that were saying, yes, I want to buy that book. So Samuel walked more than 20 miles in the first day that he started his, his, his missionary work. And he made it, made it to Bloomington, uh, New York, to a local tavern. Okay, So he tried to sell the book to the, the rough, innkeep, in, rough looking innkeeper who, who basically said that the, the Book of Mormon um, was was not true, and he actually called Samuel Smith a liar, and he threw him out of his tavern. Now, remember, Samuel Smith was six foot four, so I don't think he really threw him out, but uh, but Samuel Smith ended up leaving, and so he ended up sleeping that night under an apple tree and going to bed without any food. So the next day, he was walking around and talking to people, and he found a Methodist preacher by the name of John P. Green. And Samuel tried to convince convince that reverend of the importance of the book, but but the, the, the preacher was a little bit skeptical. Um, but his, his wife was listening uh, on the side, and the conversation went something like this. Well, Mr. Smith, I am not personally interested in your book, but if you will leave a copy here, I will take it on my circuit, and I'll make a list of any people who might be interested in buying it for you. Well, that wasn't much, that wasn't that didn't really have a lot of success. So he was pretty discouraged. So Samuel came back. He did leave the book, but he came back two weeks later, uh, and the Reverend Green had not found anyone interested. So he left the book with him anyway, hoping for some interest in, in about his next round of, of of preaching. And about the end of July, he returned again, and this time Samuel was determined to get either a dollar twenty-five for the book that he left, or to retrieve it from from Reverend Green. And it just so happened that the, the um, that it was a providential moment in that moment in time. So, and Mr. Green wasn't actually home when Samuel came to retrieve the book, but his wife Rhoda was. Now he talked with her for a little while, and then um, he was determined to take the book. So he asked her, and and Rhoda didn't want him to take the book. She said, "Sir, I have read this book." and I know it to be true. And, and she asked Samuel at that time if he would pray with her. So they actually knelt down in prayer and Rhoda said, I have never heard any prayer so, and it filled her with the Spirit of God. And during the prayer, the Spirit whispered to Samuel Smith to leave the book with Rhoda. So he encouraged her, uh, he really encouraged her to, to, to tell her husband to read the book and how he could obtain his own testimony. And so she was thrilled to do so. Well, the woman's name, her maiden name, was Rhoda Young Green. So I don't know if you know any Youngs in the church, but what ended up happening is that, that, that Rhoda ended up um, sharing the book with her husband. Her husband ended up um, becoming a member of the church, and Samuel was able to sell copies. And Rhoda also shared it with her brother, who happened to be the second prophet of, who became the second prophet of the church, who was uh, President Brigham Young. But he was the President Brigham Young at the time. But he, he ended up um, uh, reading the Book of Mormon, finding it was true, and he ended up joining the saints at a later time. And so it, not only were, were, were they converted, but because of the work of Samuel and his willingness to go and teach uh, the Book of Mormon to others, and share that that knowledge. Um, other members of the church were, were able to benefit from that. So, what what a beautiful beautiful story. And, and I, I wasn't sure if any of you knew that story, so I wanted to share that with you. I want to testify to you that I know that the Book of Mormon is true. I know that missionary work is super important. And I hope that all of you, at some point in time in your life, would like would would prepare yourself to serve a full time mission. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This week, our lesson was on Doctrine and Covenants, section 23 through 26. 
And it talks about when the church was first organized, there weren't very many members. And the Lord asked the saints to build up the church by sharing the gospel and strengthening one another. And we can do the same today. There are different ways and places that the Lord has taught us to pray. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 23, verse 6, if you don't have your scriptures, go and get them. And it says, uh, Ye must pray vocally before the world as well as in secret and in your family and among your friends and in all places. We're going to go to Brother Balitz for a brand new song called I Pray in Faith. All right, let's try this, listening to this new video. It's called, I Pray in Faith. suffered many trials, but he was able to be patient in his affliction because the Lord promised that he would always be with him. And the Lord said to Joseph about his afflictions in Doctrine and Covenants section 24 verses 1 and 8. Listen to these scriptures. Behold, thou wast called and chosen to write the Book of Mormon, and to my ministry. And I have lifted thee up out of thine afflictions, and have counseled thee that thou hast been delivered from all thine enemies, and thou hast been delivered from the powers of Satan and from darkness. Be patient in afflictions, for thou shalt have many, but endure them, for lo, I am with thee even unto the end of thy days. Let's go and learn more about Emma and Joseph Smith and the restoration of the gospel. Here's a video for you. Chapter 13, Joseph and Emma, July 1830. Joseph and Emma Smith lived on a small farm in Pennsylvania. They loved each other and worked hard to help each other. Joseph and Emma endured many hardships. They had a baby boy, but he died. They were very sad. Joseph worried about his family. They were poor, and he wanted to take care of them. He needed to plant crops so his family would have food. Joseph also worried about the church. Some people continued to make trouble for the saints, and some church leaders had to hide from them. Sometimes Joseph had to leave home to help the saints. Joseph was sorry to leave, and Emma worried when he went away. Joseph prayed to know what he should do. Jesus told him not to be afraid of the people who were trying to hurt him. Jesus said Joseph should be patient in his afflictions. 
he said he would always help Joseph. Jesus said Joseph should plant his crops and then go help the saints in other areas. Jesus also told him not to worry about food, clothes, or money. The saints would give him what he needed. Jesus gave Joseph Smith a revelation for Emma. Jesus said Emma Smith was a special lady. He had chosen her to do important work. Jesus said Emma should comfort Joseph when he had troubles. She should help him be happy and not worry. Jesus said Emma should teach the saints and help them learn the scriptures. He said the Holy Ghost would help her know what to teach. Jesus also said Emma should use her time to study. She should learn and write many things. Jesus asked Emma to choose songs for the saints to sing. The songs would be printed in a songbook. Heavenly Father loves to hear righteous people sing. Their songs are a prayer to Him, and these prayers will be answered with a blessing. Jesus told Emma to be humble and to love her husband. He told her to be happy because of the blessings that would come to Joseph. Jesus told Emma to be happy and rejoice. He also told her to keep her covenants. If she did, she would receive great blessings and be able to return to live with Him in heaven. Jesus said that the things He told Emma Smith are for all people. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 25, verses 11 and 12, it says, And it shall be given thee also to make a selection of sacred hymns, as it shall be given thee, which is pleasing unto me to be had in my church. For my soul delighteth in the song of the heart, yea, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me, and it shall be answered with a blessing upon their heads. Jesus loves the song of the heart. We have a cute video by Latter-day Kids to give an example. Three little birds were flying around the forest. These birds had a very special talent. They were songbirds. Whenever they felt something in their hearts, they would sing about it. And whenever they saw other animals in the forest, they would stop and sing a song just for them. First, the songbirds saw a woodpecker making a hole in a tree. The songbirds flew over to the woodpecker and shared what was in their hearts. Songbirds saw two beavers building a dam. The songbirds flew over to the beavers and shared what was in their hearts. Songbirds saw a turtle walking in the forest. The songbirds flew over to the turtle and shared what was in their hearts.
that we could share whatever is in our hearts just by singing? And did you know that singing is one of the ways we can talk to Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ? They are very pleased when we sing to them from our hearts. The scriptures teach us that when we sing to them, it's like a prayer. And the scriptures promise the song of our hearts will be answered with a blessing. So, what song is in your heart? For my soul delighteth in the song of the heart. Yea, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me, and it shall be answered with a blessing upon their heads. The Lord said that sacred music is pleasing unto me. Did you know that singing can not only be a fun activity, but also is a way to worship our Heavenly Father? We have another song called Lift Up Your Voice and Sing. So let's go to Brother Valens. Okay, now we're going to listen to Lift Up Your Voice and Sing. after the church was organized, the Lord assigned Emma to make the first hymnal. The saints needed ways to learn newly revealed gospel truths and to uni unite in praising God. Hymns would be at the heart of their worship and learning. After Emma Smith was baptized, the Lord told her to cleave unto the covenants which she had made. The word cleave in this verse means to hold on tightly to something. What a wonderful thing to know that our Heavenly Father has given us a way to hold on to those things that we know are true. Emma faced a lot of trials but she continued to keep the covenant she had made with the Lord. We're going to go to Brother Valence for a song, and then we'll come back for our weekly challenge. As we're coming to the end of our video today, we need to start getting ready and thinking about things that are coming in our future, like Mother's Day. This is one of Sister Valence's favorite songs. I think we need to go over it and practice it some more. We'll do it again next week. Maybe we might get this thing it all together. Let's sing. Because I often go walking.
now for our challenge. This week, I would like you to choose a favorite song. It can be from the hymn book or the primary song book and sing it with your family. An extra thing, sing it and have someone videotape it and we will put it in the video next week and there might be a special surprise for everyone who sends me their video. So there's your challenge. We're glad you were with us today. We love you, we miss you, we pray for you. Please be safe and we will see you next Sunday. Bye.